Hello, Rune Scholar, wherever and whenever you are. I'm the modern Aralar. When I introduced the linguistic changes between the 6th and the 8th centuries that evolved Proto-Scandinavian into Old Norse and the ensuing dominance of younger Futhark in the 8th century, I mentioned that the forms of the runes of younger Futhark depended upon where and when the runes were written. Since I also introduced a Western Danish find from Ribe as a good example of a Futhark that is mostly transitioned to the form of the language prevalent during the Viking Age, Denmark is an easy place to start describing variants in the younger Futhark. On the Ribe skull fragment, which I showed you last episode, the transition to the simplified runic forms of the younger Futhark was nearly complete. Let's take a closer look at the Futhark that appears within this particular find and assess what has simplified in comparison to the elder Futhark. As I mentioned, there was one rune, Oz, which did not appear in a word within this inscription, so I've placed this rune in brackets. Otherwise, you can see right off that we've already lost eight of the runes, so now we're down to 16. But you can also see that there's a pretty remarkable continuity, if you compare the top and the bottom lines here, in the order of the runes themselves, when compared against the Elder Futhark. We have a new rune, Ir, or the final R rune, that's uh, here in this order where the Algis used to be, and the vertically reversed allograph here. So this is uh, here, and then it's sort of a 180 degree flip, um, vertically reversing it. This allograph here has the staves pointing downward, and that's the new Ir rune. In Winnowing down to 16 runes, this Futhark kept only the simpler form of any of the different stops. So of the runes that represent the T and the D sounds, T and D, uh, we kept the less, complace, less complex shape of the T. And uh, with the P and the B runes, we've kept only uh, this Berbrika here as we call it now in Younger Futhark. Uh, G and K have simplified into this new cow rune that I also introduced last episode. The star rune here is now used for the oral or short A sound rather than the yo or ya diphthongs for which it was used in the Anglo-Saxon Futhark. The Sol rune is backwards from what we might expect to see in the later forms of this particular rune, but given that any number of zigzags could have appeared for this rune in Elder Futhark, it's nice to see this rune stabilizing into a fairly regular form already. One of the other characteristics of the Younger Futhark is that the rune forms decrease the number of staves, uh, the vertical lines, per rune form. I mentioned that the Heigl and the Mom runes were the only two remaining rune forms that preserve multiple staves. So let's go a few decades later in Denmark and see what happens. The inscription on the Helnes stone shows that these Heigl and Mon runes still appeared around 800 of the Common Era on the Danish island of Fyn. However, this stone shows a difference in its use of a new shape with a single upwardly crossing diagonal for the short A rune. If we look another few decades later, the Jörlev stone from the island of Sjælland gives us a 16-rune futhark with the 
new short a plus a new rune order uh, where the simplification of Heidi and Moln is now complete. Uh, all runes in this Futh arc now have a single stave. Uh, Heigl has taken over the shape of the star rune, which at Ribe and Egya had been used for the short A vowel. Moln in this Futh arc has uh, a circle or two rounded twigs at the top of the stave. Uh, we also see this Ir, rune, now move to the end of the Futh arc, and that order will persist through later developments of Futh arcs. Neither the Riba skull fragment uh, nor the Helnes stone had a Futh arc explicitly written out, so we can't be too clear on when this move to the end of the Futh arc actually occurred. So if we compare these various Futh arcs, we can observe an important point made by Marie Stockland, that the reduction in the number of runes probably occurred before the simplification of the rune forms. You can also start to suss out some allographs here, like the various directions of the S rune, and that the determination between angular and rounded forms is not necessarily a differentiation based on the medium upon which the runes are written, whether the runes are carved on stone here or on a, another material. Michael Barnes warns against drawing conclusion that these inscriptions are representative of large categorical developments, like when Eric Moltke calls the Stentoften stone a late primitive Norse futhark followed by the Helnes stones early Viking age, but that's because the development of criteria for runes that apply to a broad time and place requires accurate dating as a basis, and unless we can relate an inscription to a datable artifact such as a coin from the same excavation, or establish the year in which a piece of wood was cut, via tree ring analysis or dendrochronology, sometimes our relative chronology between sites is at best an educated guess. Uh, you'll also notice here that I'm specifying that these are long twig variants in Denmark, so it will probably be useful to differentiate some terminology before continuing. I've been using the terms stave and twig pretty regularly for several episodes, the stave being the upright uh, foundational of the line, um, and the twigs are uh, the typically horizontal or diagonal strokes that differentiate the various runes, and twig and branch tend to be used pretty interchangeably. We see a divergence in the Younger Futh arc where the length of the branch or twig becomes shorter, and you can see this in the length of the lower branch of the Feihu written here, and the cross branch of the Maut here. The Futh arcs that tend to have the longer twigs are very helpfully called long twig or long branch, and the Versions that have the shorter twigs or branches are helpfully also called short twig or short branch Futh arcs. The long twig runes are the more common type overall, and most rune stones tend to be written using this style of younger Futh arc, especially the Danish rune stones. Short twig runes are both faster and simpler than long twig runes, but these appear only very rarely in what used to be Viking Denmark. They appear more often in Swedish and Norwegian contexts, so some scholars have referred to them as Swedish-Norwegian short twig runes, but they definitely occurred in Denmark. Two carved lengths of wood from the Viking settlement at Heiteby show inscriptions using short twig runes. This one includes a full Futh arc in this short twig variant, but I'd like to point out that this is one of the instances where we actually see the twigs of the nasal A 
extend from the Anglo-Frisian form rather than shorten, though they have come down the stave. In short twig futharks, it is usually this nasal A and the B forms that show variation, in that the twigs can appear on either side of the stave as long as they maintain these directions. So uh, this downward diagonal here and this upward diagonal here. For example, the nasal A can be either up and to the left or down and to the right or extend on both sides of the stave and all three of these variations indicate the same short nasal A rune. This find is broadly dated though to any but the last 50 years of occupation at the site. So that 200 year span isn't particularly helpful in determining a chronology of the development of short twig runes in Denmark. Rune scholars can't agree on exactly when the divergence between long twig and short twig futharks occurred, partly because the dating of some of our best evidence as of early 2024 doesn't give us much to go on. One of the Haitabi rune stones also features two short twig runes, which you can see here and here, among mostly long twig runes. Barnes pointed out that we should default to the more prevalent type of rune for our determination when deciding whether inscriptions that show a mix of short twig and long twig runes themselves represent a full short twig or long twig futhark variation. So this rune stone really only shows us that a couple short twig runes appeared in a mostly long twig inscription, but it's still useful to know that the two systems can mix. And just in case you would like a screenshot of each of these futharks together, here we are. So now that we've shown some Danish futharks, let's discuss what the Danes of the Viking Age called their runes. Most of what we know comes from the Abecedarium Nordmanicum, which Matthias Nordvig calls the Danish rune poem because it may have been translated from a Danish original. I say translated because it was actually written in a mixture of the North Germanic languages Old Saxon and Old High German by a Saxon or Rhineland area cleric. This image is from further down the same page where the Anglo-Saxon runes appear in their list, and you can see that it looks really rough now. Thankfully, Wilhelm Grimm made this copy in 1828, which is much more legible. This poem gives a pretty simple mnemonic for remembering the names of the long twig runes. Translated to English, it reads, Fehu, wealth, first, Ur, or wild cattle, after, Toris, or nature spirit, third stave. Oz, the god Woden, is above it. Rot, the wheel, is written in the end. Kaun, the ulcer, divides it. Hogel, hail, has not need. Ice, year, and sun. Tu, the god Tyr. Brika, birch, and man in the middle. Logu, water, shining. And Ir, the U, has it all. So that's what they called their runes. We'll continue next time by exploring Futharks in Norway and several of the North Atlantic Scandinavian colonies, such as Orkney or Greenland. Thank you for reading the runes with me, The Modern Era.